All right, let's see. Everything is working right. Looks like it is. Yep. Uh, okay, so welcome to Evidence Based Audio number 214. And this is the perverse inverse. Hopefully, I don't have another video with the same title, but even if I do, I guess it needs to be said again. And uh, I don't have any guests on this one. This is just me. This is just going to be short. But this first one, uh, there was a video, well, it's kind of clickbaity, but it's short. It's not like the ones where you wait 20 minutes before they say anything. It's uh, from Colt Caperune, Caperune, I don't know how you say his name. And it's about, it's called Mixed Tutorials Never Tell You This. And it's like some secret, you know, clickbait thing, whatever. But the gist of it is... Um, He he went to watch this uh, Chris Lord Algae presentation, and he was marveling that the raw tracks already sounded so amazingly good compared to his uh, fix it in the mix type of tracks that he got before. But I think people really got to understand that. And this is why it's it's a perverse inverse. Like the bands who are most able to pay in the studio frequently need the least amount of money to sound good at a basic level. The bands who are least able to afford studio time also don't play very well uh, usually. And, and there's, there's a bunch of other things. There's, there's arrangement. I mean, arrangement matters so much. If you look at the difference between, okay, let me, let me just back up. If you haven't done both major label and local band kind of stuff, you may not even be aware of this. So this, I mean, so the, to him, this was a surprise. And, um, I guess probably, you know, from the outside, it would seem a surprise anyway. And I guess even maybe from the inside, but but really, you know, it, it makes perfect sense. The the people with the the most money, the most established, uh, people who are professionals and do song, re, you know, record songs as as session players or whatever for a living, are just that much better at making basic tracks. Like, but there's so much to it. Like, if you when you're on one of these major label acts, whatever, chances are, I, I know, I know you can shatter the illusion and uh, see the man behind the curtain. But most of the time, the, 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 the people whose pictures are on the album aren't, <clears throat> aren't really the people who wrote the song so much. You know, maybe they wrote the lyrics or maybe, maybe they came up with a lot of it. But the final studio arrangement is often very, very, very different than what any, any band would write. And the arrangers arrange the music and the playing. And I mean, I'm talking even into some pretty technical metal stuff where it's written in a way that instruments don't clash with each other. They don't mud each other up. Remember when you're dealing with local bands, one of your biggest problems is, is mud, right? You're, you're fighting a bunch of instruments that are, that are all struggling with each other to be heard in the exact same spot you know either in the especially the low mid-range right or you know the part where the most intelligible parts of speech are which is you know for a for a pop album that the only thing that matters is the vocals right and um to have a bunch of instruments clashing with that that thing right there it's a problem. So when you have these like really super pro bands, they got a, they got a producer and they got a, a professional songwriting team behind them. They write in a way that makes it that much easier to mix later on that the, <clears throat> the guitar and the bass don't really clash with each other. The, the bass and the drums don't really clash with each other and the guitar and the vocals don't really clash with each other. And they're often arranged in, in types of layers where, it's, it's a lot thinner at different parts of the song than others for 
<clears throat> just just to get out of the way. And and it's amazing because you do end up with with raw tracks that pretty much you can just push the faders up and they sound amazing. And also, you know, the studio players. Again, I hope I'm not surprising anybody, but the the person who played drums on the album is not necessarily the the person whose picture is there you know a, a lot of these are i mean look at the the history of like uh groups like the wrecking crew where they they just get in there and they they do several albums a day for other people and they're they're just amazing session musicians their job is to play in a way that records in the least amount of time sounds the best and just doesn't clash they come in with with intonated guitars how many times have you intonated a local band's guitars on the studio clock you, you have to right but they come in with perfect instruments they come in with the arrangements already known they know how to play this stuff and they just go and you end up with really awesome tracks you know and so it, it's hard because the the local bands they need the they need the the most time and money and yet they don't have the money to pay for this so it, it's that's the perverse inverse. So it's good to aim for really awesome raw tracks, but you know, there's years ago, gosh, was it more than 20 years ago now? Uh, I met, you know, these guys brought in a, a four track cassette of uh, what would become kind of the modern horror punk movement, uh, the heir to the misfits throne for sure. And, uh, the songs were really good and, um, they weren't necessarily the best technical players for recording. And, you know, to me, it, it kind of didn't matter. I, I would rather have the good songs than the perfect playing and perfect recording. But in the end, you know, it, you know, they, they complain about not getting good raw tracks. You know, you, you always hear it. You read them on the forums or see it on, on the Facebook engineering groups. Oh, you got to get the perfect raw tracks. Well, well no, you don't. Uh, you have to get, to me, you, you just got to get the stuff that's going to make the song. If you got to fix it all up, you can. It's nice to get this perfect stuff, but you may not. And uh, you got to know how to deal with both of them. And so I know that's kind of rambly, but. It's nice. It really is nice to get just an awesome recording. But at the same time, if, if you're ending up with a really good song that has a couple mistakes in it, you could fix that stuff. Don't worry about it. Also, though, the guy's point was that these tracks were already perfect and ready to go. That's not true. Uh, I don't know if he said it exactly like that, but that's, that's definitely not the case. Even after those tracks are all raw, perfect sounding there's still so much stuff that goes into into the editing and, and, and everything. Like, I mean, he's talking about a, a Green Day. Or he's talking about Chris Lord Algae, okay? And you know, it's, it's no secret you hear the same <laughs> drums on most of that stuff, right? I mean, there's so much work that goes into that. So anyway, um, I'm going to go on to something else here. Uh, but that's, that's the perverse inverse. So remember... Uh, it's nice to get perfect tracks, and it's amazing to hear the type of tracks that professional bands in a professional session end up with. But that may not be the best thing for what you're you're doing on a local level and trying to get these new artists out. You know, it it's take a couple mistakes, you can fix those. Um, better better to have a good song. If you don't got either, then yeah, you're, you're totally screwed. Okay, so. Next thing you hear. Um, okay, so this is from Mixbus TV. And I don't know if you guys have seen it. It was a while ago, actually. I was on one of their, uh, on this channel for, um, this is actually a talk about the creation of Reaper and some of the other things. Actually, some audio myths and stuff. And one of the things I'm always going on about is summing, summing buses, analog summing. Like there's some kind of magical process that happens when you summon analog. And, uh, so this is a video from Mixbus TV, and it's called Summing Mixers in 2023. Worth it? Question mark. So let's uh let's let's see what, what Mixbus has to say here. 
And let me know if you can hear it. Circuit Squirrel. What is inside of a summon box which somewhat emulates going through a console? I try asking people and they generally say the same stupid fluffy things like it's just analog circuitry that makes it sound that way. But if yep. that were the and case, that's people... Usually, that's usually the answer you get, right? Uh, sorry, let me, uh, let me back that up. Like it's just analog circuitry that makes it sound that way. But if that were the case, people would just loop an analog cable from DA to AD. Somehow it's hard for me to believe that engineers such Chris Moot or folks at Neve don't have far more specific sonic target goals in mind than simply creating an analog circuit. I'd love to know more about this. Of course they do have <laughs> much uh, more specific sonic goal than just an analog circuit. You should take the things with a grain of salt. I have this infamous at this point video that I make years ago in which I was explaining why I don't use nor like uh, some mixers, although that video was old and it was referring to the very first generation of some mixers, which were literally just boxes with analog cables <laughs> with a few transformers in them. That's yeah. So again, how many times are we going to go through this one? Like, it, what is it that you want to happen to your sound? Because a digital sum is is what you hear, is what you get. You want to change that? Fine. Uh, the, the, the issue is like companies like Neve and SSL, their job was to, they wanted the most transparent sound coming out the end. They didn't want to add noise. They didn't want to add distortion. They didn't want to mess up the, the frequency response or the bandwidth of the audio coming in. They were trying for the most pristine, transparent, uh, summing and everything else possible that was their thing they weren't trying to to change the sound and i know you guys think transformers will change the sound it's in the name right transform but how many abx tests have you seen where you throw a transformer in the way and they can't pick which one is which and i, I like how he said um if if the case was just to go analog you just plug a analog cable from the digital to analog converter to the analog to digital converter and record it back in. It's true. Hey, Foo Ninja. And if you want to know, like to answer your question, mainly what's inside some mixers is transformers. That's what gives the uh, analog sound. But not every console <clears throat> had a transformer in every every channel. You know, so so throwing transformers in is actually doing something. You know, it, it, it may not do much. And, you know, we can argue about just how how much fidelity a, a, a really good transformer has or what it might do that you want it to do, you know, cause some distortion and, and frequency response issues. Which is the same things that you find in compressors or EQ that are, so to speak, colored. Different transformers give different colors. So Carnil for that Neve uh, kind of effect, Cinemag, or even still, I don't take my word for it. Go out and find <clears throat> actual specs on these transformers. And you'll see that in general, a good transformer is meant to be as transparent as possible. And, and most of the time, you're not going to be able to ABX between the two different transformers. You can get a really bad transformer, sure. But for the most part, it's not going to be this gigantic difference, you know, and we, we insist on Jensen transformers for some stuff because kind of that's what we've always used. It's more tradition and ritual than, you know, but I mean, there are bad transformers, but remember when we did the, the direct box tests, that super cheap, like it was a $30, whatever the whirlwind or Rapco, whatever the DI 100, those had to, I mean, the, the, the whole unit cost less than a Jensen transformer. And it was, I can't remember if it's actually better or is it at least as good as the as the Jensen JT DBE. A bad transformer is that a GoBot? Well, actually, transformers all owe their life to um, Robotech, right, or Macross or something, or UTI or Souter, like for example in Fairchild and stuff. So different transformers will give you a different collection of harmonics, a different. Uh, THD, a different distortion, different color, character, 
uh, trend. This is all true, but those may be underneath the threshold of audibility. And shaving trends and response, all these things. Transformers are a big part of why a certain machine sounds different than the other. And not only that, but of course the circuit itself also changes uh, the sound. So, but mainly what you find in, in um, some mixers is transformers. And then of course there's other things. Some have tubes in it. So that depends on what tubes they use, what the circuit that houses the tubes is, what's the voltage of the circuit. And I'm not sure who are the people that say, oh, some analog circuitry. Yeah, no, sh you know, but it would be like, oh yeah, a car has four wheels. And so the cars are all the same. Uh, now the new generation of some mixers also have other added processing inside. For example, I think there's a, the dangerous one that makes it one with a transformers that you can control the color of it, not just by how hard you hit it with the signal, but it actually has a knob, it has a, some have a, like a parallel compression. Pro so again, you're doing something to it. This isn't what consoles do to your sound. Uh, this, is, this is you going above and beyond. Processing. So they started adding things. Uh, the Neve, I think, has the silk buttons, like two different types of color, like the red and the blue, like I have on my tape emulators. So they. Oh, yeah, see, Poon Ninja is bringing up a thing. Um, I'm particular about my inline capacitor resistor, uh, I mean, instrument cables. So I have, uh, I have some of those line six wireless units that'll give you cable tone, like they'll, they'll knock out some of the highs or whatever. Um, you you can switch it. You can actually turn it on a dial. Like how how long of a cable do you want to simulate? And uh, you know it's funny. I always turn that off. But um, I did find that for all the experts constantly babbling on about how much they test these things and how how you know you got to worry about what what type of paint is on your guitar because it changes the sound or whatever. I've never read a report that said that these Line six wireless units, the ones they're all talking about is all perfect and stuff, distort like hell under even moderately loud pickups. I mean, isn't this stuff that's made for people with EMGs? And EMGs distort the crap out of uh, the line six, even like the Relay G50, the, you know, one of the higher end ones. And uh, so I, I question, you know, they're, they're worried about their cable tone or whatever. What about the distorting when you. Play a chord on the damn thing, you know? Ah, anyway. They started adding more processing in analog summon mixers right now because they kind of heard my video probably and understood that nobody really wants a dumb box where there's literally just inputs and a couple of transformers in it. Oh, I wouldn't say no, but there's a whole lot of people that just want a dumb box, but you know, I, I get your point. And most important, nobody wants to pay two, three, four thousand dollars for that. So uh, they kind of all the companies up their game in the summing mixer and they have more features now but the thing with summing mixers that i didn't like back then when i made that video was the marketing that was around them right they were trying to sell the summing mixer as the cure for digital and that the digital sum was your bottleneck and that was the re yeah you know just just before we get too crazy. If we go way back to my old Don't Get Jacked blog, where this is about, um, you know, all this nonsense and myths and stuff that you see in the audio world, um, the very first one, very first one that I, that I went to, my first, my second blog post, but the first product we're talking about was Analog sum Summing Boxes. And actually, he said the name, Dangerous. They were... Um, they were talking about the dangerous two bus or whatever. It's one of these analog summing mixers. And, uh, you know, I talked about what they claimed. They claimed, um, they claimed that, uh, let's see. Where was the, okay. So there, they they were talking about like the frequency response, I think, but you know, um, Frequency response to digital is, is, you know, basically perfect up to Nyquist or, you know, at least to the anti-aliasing converter. Um, distortion, you know, you're not going to distort anything on a floating point. 
uh, until you come back out. And noise, you're not getting any noise except for maybe quantization error unless you add it. Signal to error ratio at 64 bit float or even 32 bit or whatever some of the DAWs are using, who cares? And with today's level squashed so hard that eight, eight bits would sound just fine. Didn't we just do a video where we went down to like five bits and a modern song pretty much sounded the same as it did at, at 16 bits? Um, what are we worried about? So what are, you, what are you trying to achieve with the analog summing box? That vintage magic, that unquantifiable something that does something to your signal. Um, so they were claiming incredible imaging, more punch and detail, and unbelievable headroom. And uh, let's see. So incredible imaging. So in my DAW, when I pan something, it doesn't actually go where I pointed it? Or does this mean something else? You know, of course, again, these are weasel words, right? Like incredible imaging. What the hell does that mean? Um, I, I, I can almost guarantee that if you're talking about anything to do with the sound stage and panning, uh, digital's going to beat the crap out of it. More punch and detail. Punch. In today's square wave, white noise approximated hyper-compressed brick mixes. What, what the hell does punch even mean? And, and what do you measure it in? Uh, what units is punch measured in? You know, are, are you saying that by something you admit is going to distort the signal, you're going to get more transient clarity? I don't think so. So I don't know what you mean by punch because that's definitely not it. Um, detail. What, what do you use to measure detail? In? And I guarantee again, you're, you're getting better detail at, oh, sorry, one second. Oh, thank you. Um, you're getting better detail on digital than you are on analog by any, I don't even know how that could, I don't even know how these guys would say you, you wouldn't. And then unbelievable headroom. I said, yeah, you're right. I don't believe it's going to give me more dynamic range than 64-bit float. What the hell does that even mean? Um, so anyway, so that, I was talking about summing mixers. That was one of my first things way back in the day, so kind of crazy. Reason, because in-the-box mixes didn't sound like out-of-the-box mixes or analog, yeah. and that's completely false. There's nothing wrong with the digital sum. Actually, the digital sum is perfect and i actually have a video on it don't have to believe me with one of the creators of the daw reaper and we talk about this in that video and we talked about oh, wow. i think he's talking about the video i was on with him well that's awesome thank you the audio engine and how to put it this way the audio engine is the equal sign in yep. in an equation so and, if and that's what i was saying so you basically your summing is, is just an equal sign. I mean, really, that's what it is. And, you know, there's there's some way outside edge cases with pathological files where you can do some pretty nutty things to to break the summing. But, but man, the levels we're talking about are so far beyond what you'd even be able to come close to on an analog system that, you know, come on. If, if, if one's bad, then the other one is horrendous. If you have two plus two equal four, the equal is your audio engine in your DAW, the sum, right? If this equation doesn't equal four, it equal five, your audio engine, your equal sign is broken. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with the digital sum. So there's no need to fix and buy a machine that fixes the bottleneck because there's no bottleneck. Now we can argue that we don't like perfect and we want the color, we want the nonlinearities and that's- And, and, and this is, um, you know, I'm okay with this. If you want to change your stuff, go for it. Uh, you know, I, I know people, my hero, right? Bill Matoyer, um, instead of sticking some limiter on the end of the mixing console, he's going into like his slamming into a, into the, the two track reel to reel back in the day. I don't know if he still does this, but back in the day, I mean, he just annihilates the level going in on um, into the into the master two track, and I mean, it's like if you can see the needles going backwards, that it's too quiet, you know. Like, and and it sure it did. It clipped off the top of all these little transients you weren't going to hear anyway. And and um, of course, it did a lot of other stuff to it as well. 
But, you know, and another guy, he's like, you know, what's what's your favorite way to convert from 48K or 96K to 44K for a CD? And he would just point at the uh, at the reel to reel. And it's like, oh, hey, you know, and, and it's got its own sound to it. And sometimes it does something that, that you really, really, really like. So nothing wrong with that. Uh, so Boon Ninja saying, um, uh, vintage magic equals sounds like old stuff. So if older is better, why aren't we using pins to cut wax rolls for truly analog precision? Yeah. And, you know, a lot of this stuff comes from people who never had the tyranny of, of being chained to a constantly breaking analog console and a, and a, and a reel to reel machine where every time you hit play, you were, you were degrading the sound. You're stretching the tape, you're scrubbing it through the heads. Ah, okay. Get off my lawn. Why people uh, now market um, some mixer that way. But for me, it's much better to buy other analog units if you want analog color and not a Summit mixer, but that's just me. If you guys have questions for the Q&A, leave them in the comments down below. Consider using the super thanks and support the channel. Click the join button and access the exclusive members only mix and mastering courses. Many more are coming in the next weeks. Don't forget to subscribe, like this video, comment down below. See you next time. Okay. so. As much as I don't care for, especially the, the marketing speak of these guys selling these summing boxes and stuff, there's some handy stuff. If they have like inserts, um, yeah, it can be a pain to run out to compressors and things like that. Sometimes having this in there plugged in all the time makes it easier to plug in analog gear if you really want. I, I don't care for, I, I used to still have like a hybrid mixing approach um, almost 20 years ago. I, I don't anymore. But I know people who do, and um, it can make it easier for that. But summing boxes, summing mixers in 2023, worth it? Uh, I don't know. What, what's the answer there? Um, to me, hell no. But if you need a hybrid mixing approach, it, it could be helpful. But honestly, I would just probably plug those things into um, some ins and outs on, on your converters anyway. And, uh, you know, we've got reinsert for that purpose in Reaper. Uh, okay, so... There's over at Safe Space, there's a thread. Um, how important are preamps and AD converters for the end product sonic quality? And, um, you know, of course we talk about this all the time, but I'll just read the, just read it. I'm slowly but surely upgrading my home studio after buying some analog synths. It's time to stop using my soundtrack, Soundcraft MTK12 as audio interface and buy something better. For example, a UAD Apollo X. A friend told me I should also buy a preamp like a UAD Solo 610 to have proper high quality recording pipeline. That's a lot of money. Do you think it's worth the investment? In your experience, what are the major differences you can hear in the final project? For example, a mixed master track between cheap audio interface and expensive audio interface powered with an expensive preamp. Okay. So I went over this a lot of times, but one of the major differences in, in audio interfaces are the drivers like how, how how insane do you want to be driven by problems what's the what's the lowest latency you want how much system resources and stability do you want to give up in order to achieve that latency how stable do you want your system um, how important is it to you that the manufacturer continues to support your device way later on. That's where audio interfaces differ to me. The, in the mainly, I mean, when it comes to the drivers, drivers matter. And except for some crazy exceptions, and, and I don't even know that, that you could actually say that it's, it's even true, uh, that these exceptions really exist completely in this way. RME has just absolutely annihilated the market in this. The, the difference between their round trip latency at, at any given buffer size and the rest of the market is, it's kind of mind blowing. Um, every other driver after that, again, there's, there's some exceptions, but they're almost all made by the same company. Uh, when you're talking USB, this is this company called Vesicon. Uh, or that's, that's how, um, that's how, uh, what's his name? The DAW bench guy calls it. Um, but that's, that's, that's the con or the Sycon.de. 
Um, let's go. How do we go to it's these guys? They make the drivers for pretty much everybody. You guys talk like, oh, this one, you buy this one is so much better. And it's the same driver. So audio performance wise, some of these things are a little bit different, not by much. And I mean, some of them might be drastically, maybe they'll have more mic uh, preamp gain. But it's not hard to make a pretty much ruler flat mic preamp at this point with very little noise. And so you're really not changing things all that much. And, um, you know, the, the snark that I am, I, I always, um, of course, um, somebody said, and this is, this is where, so, okay. Uh, actually let's, let's, let's go back a little bit. So one of the things that I, you know, you know how much I get upset about is this clock magic claims. And, um, you know, they're talking about, um, of course, clocks, um, that somehow a clock is going to make everything so much better. And, you know, one guy is saying, you know, I, I like the, the noise that my device gives me, you know, if you really want that noise, fine. I, I, I don't, I don't really believe you. I think it's just something you're, you're used to. You know, so somebody of course says preamps and converters can bring your recordings to the next level, depending on how you use them. And so I always ask evidence. Is there any evidence for that? Of course, they're not going to say anything. Um, another guy said, um, how clean do you want the glass when you look out the window? Dirty glass, dirty glass might not seem dirty until you clean it. And then afterwards appreciate the newfound visual clarity. Clean preamps converters are like clean glass. It matters. There are roughly speaking three levels, budget, Scarlet, Behringer, et cetera, competitive mid-range, Apogee, Duet, UAD, Apollo, et cetera, exotic, expensive, Prism, Burl, et cetera. Um, of course, remember, somebody actually tested this stuff and um, took a bunch of different mic preamps. Uh, let's see, real gear measurements, mic preamps. Um, Somebody actually measured this stuff and found that those cheap budget preamps are pretty much ruler flat. They might not have as much gain as some of the super high end ones. That's a difference. But, but aside from that, you're not gaining unless you're trying to distort something, unless you're trying to, to break something, you're not really gaining by paying more except again for possibly more, uh, mic preamp gain. So I said, for those of us who actually test this stuff, the budget level mic pre's are insanely flat and would most certainly be the clean window in this analogy. Perhaps you want a dirty window and would spend more for that if some of these mic preamps are meant to distort the, the sound. But hint, when you actually measure, most any decent pre is about ruler flat, aside from some that put a bit of treble boost, which can easily be added by a plug-in EQ later. It's crazy how often people parrot claims but never put any data in or never show their work. And so some good answers here. Uh, let's see what really good enough. Good enough. Um, and then people claim they hear the difference between stuff, but they don't give you any evidence. Um, how many transformers do they have, bro? Exactly. Um, uh, So the you know, noise floor is a big problem. There isn't one. And this turns out to be a bit cheap sounding and even a bit uncomfortable to the ears. That sizzle of the needle hitting the record, the hiss. So people are talking about comfort noise. I don't care about comfort noise. I care about it in cell phones. And, and really, if you do have a dead, silent section of track, you might want to have something in there because it does sound weird to hear nothing at all and then then crazy loud. But um, DD Yeah says... Uh, you simply couldn't achieve certain things the way you wanted and were constantly fighting noise, trying to keep signal to noise reasonable in the olden days. Yes, you were always in between that, that either you're going to distort or you're going to make it too noisy. And you're always sitting in that horrible little zone. I mean, that was the only part of the demilitarized zone. Everything else was no man's land. Uh, so getting off analog tape was the single most significant step in achieving higher fidelity. I definitely don't want to fall back into the dark middle ages of audio technology. Um, and like he said, I pointed out as well, things got a little bit better with Dolby SR, but by that time, digital had already started taking over and these machines were ridiculously expensive. Yes. Um, and so people are like, no, but you need that noise. Um, 
and um yeah and then talking about that solo 610 whatever uh let's see mojo is just noise with a better sales rep yeah maybe um saying other than dithering all noise is evil no pixies mojo or other myths here either just gear with very good specs and proper engineering to satisfy the most discerning ears uh Mixes with a low noise floor get rated favorably. No changes in that regard in 45 years, except for that nowadays it's way more easy to achieve that goal. Um, and I'm sure they're somewhere they're talking about clocks because we have to. Okay, so somebody said, and, and this is really, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. So many of my early digital recordings were made at least after I left the big studios, because uh, back then it was it was the Dash and the the, the Pro Digi and the uh, the Dash formats, the Sony's and the Mitsubishi's. Um, it says to my ears, the second biggest scam ever was that converter quality was some kind of game changer in the phase of catch, capturing source tracks. Even the lowly Digi 888 16-bit converter is perfectly capable of capturing quality source tracks worthy of being sent to the turd polishers. Um, and Manta Ray 1 answers with, for me, this was the scam number one. And you are talking about the 888, which is maybe one of the most talked down units ever in digital audio during the early 2000s when PTHD was new. When I started working with the DAW, very soon I was hearing opinions, especially here, that converters were more important than microphones and performers. It actually affected me for a while. It affected me as well. I, I, went after some very expensive converters and um, it didn't really didn't change anything for me. Uh, I mean, I don't want to argue from anecdote, but you know, that was, that was my experience. Um, I started working with the DAW very soon. I started hearing, Oh, sorry. Uh, prior to entering the DAW world where I recorded with digital hardware recorders, I never ever really gave them much thought. In addition, if you check old Pro Magazine articles of the early 90s that review digital recorders, the converters and or the sound quality of the recorder are almost never mentioned. People just work with them. We have become far too spoiled and, uh, you know what, nowadays. Um, and, then, of course, they talk about ADATs. ADATs were so maligned. And, and, you know, yes, it sucked dealing with the VHS tape that was just constantly getting eaten or, or jumping around. It took them so long to... So, so it, for the Spam Mansion, uh, Jordy Hormel's um, recording studio, we put in 16 ADATs. I, th I think that was like the first 16 ADAT system. And, uh, man, waiting for those things to sync was just crazy. <laughs> but, you know, they, they sounded fine. I know everybody said they sound horrible, but they sounded fine. Um, so, yeah, I posted a thorough double-blind test on here nearly eight years ago of an API 5500 emulation and nobody could hear a difference and I was using extreme EQ as well. In addition, different converters were used yet nobody, yet nobody could still hear the difference so your theory doesn't hold up in some cases regarding emulation. You know, somebody's saying that um, the number one scam was that hardware emulation plugins have advanced so much in the last 20 years that they're as good as the real thing. Uh, I mean, depends how you're going to measure that anyway. Okay, so Joe Q... Thank you, Joe Q, because this is the one that makes me so mad all the time. I would put the number one scam as the one pushing of external clocks for single interface setups. I remember when I started buying my DAW interfaces and PCI cards, etc., and every time the salesman was like, well, you'll want a clock to go with that to improve your sound. Um, they seemed so surprised and puzzled when I wouldn't dit bite. And I think right here on gear space, it was either here or on, on the womb on the mixer man's thing or whatever, there was this whole blow up where, and I, I don't want to, I'm not sure if I remember this right, but I think that the moderators of safe space were actually running apologetics for Apogee, but there was like this Apogee big Ben clock thing. And they were making all these claims and, and, Man, Antelope does this today, and that's why I can't stand that company. As much as people are saying that their drivers are actually pretty good, they, they just make all these clock magic claims. And, yeah, for a single converter setup, I think Dan Lavery said that no matter what, it's going to be worse to externally clock it than internally clock. Now, when you've got multiple interfaces like I got, or interface multiple sets of analog to digital converters, they all got to be on the same clock. You could clock them with ADAT in some cases. Um, 
and then you don't have to worry about anything. Or, you know, word clock, which I'm doing here, and I don't care what clock it is. Are you seriously telling me? Like, the clock claims are just insane. Um, But then there's somebody else who says, I believe there is some overly optimistic people in here who believe that when they record with an El Cheapo preamp, then use an SSL plug-in, they will get the same result as having a real SSL disc. It would be really nice if that were true. What do you mean by that result? If you mean Sonic Fidelity, the, the plug-in is going to, well, the DAW is going to beat the crap out of any SSL any day forever. And in, in, I mean, by leaps and bounds. So I said, what do you think the difference would be aside from the plug-in having better specs in every way measurable? And uh, so DDS says, I don't know about this poster, but introducing noise, distortion, clipping, input stages of preamp center converters, misalignment on purpose has become a thing lately and often gets praised specifically by those who haven't ever had a chance to work on the old dinosaurs. And trust me, or don't trust me, but I've worked on those old dinosaurs and I wanted to die. Uh, I mean, just all the time. Those things were killing you. Um, one second. Uh, sorry. Let's see. And so Mana Ray is talking about, you're right about the clocks. I almost forgot about that. I'm sure a huge percentage of big bands, yeah, that was the Apogee one, were sold due to forums like this. And actually it continues to this day. Back then it was the big band. Nowadays it's the Grim clock, but on a lesser scale. I haven't seen the Grim. Who is that? Let's see just how terrible that is. Uh, Grim word clock. I, I'm, I'm seeing the antelopes everywhere. Okay. And how much does it cost? Where do you where do you buy them at? Maybe they tell you here. So here's the grim clock. So oh, it's got a nice wood grain. Buy now. Um, no price. No price. All right, grim word clock. Shopping. Let's see. Um, Grim CCI V2. No products found. Okay. Okay, somebody's got one on Reverb. What do they cost on Reverb? Oh, just $2,725. 2000 bucks for a clock. So you used to be able to buy these things from Art for 60 bucks. I've got two antelopes that are not antelopes, but aardvarks that uh, I don't know how much they cost when they're brand new, but they, they're like a hundred bucks now. Um, so let's see what they say. Ultra low jitter clock source. Well, as long as it's below where it matters, it, it doesn't matter. And those have been made even on the cheapest ones. 16 word clock outputs. That's nice. Having a distribution is nice. AES, CBU reclocking, uh, very variable sample rates. Great. Two independent sample rate groups, great. I mean, this is a handy device, but two thousand, almost three thousand um, uh, dollars. Now, this is probably true. Owing to a radically redesigned discrete crystal oscillators, clock stability betters that of even the best test equipment available. Okay, but there becomes a point where once you reach that level, things don't get any better audibly. They only need to get a certain certain level. Uh, Grimm's Audio's extensive research into the correlation between jitter and sound quality brought to light that emotional response to music is vastly more sensitive to jitter than previously realized. Really? Bring the receipts, because that is a hell of a claim. This is all like antelope level stuff. Um, attention turned from making jitter low to achieving the most stable clock possible. This research turned up a surprising array of previously underestimated performance factors like power supply noise, Oscillator control circuit noise and low-level crosstalk. Owing to a radically... Uh, well, let's see it. Let's see it. Where's the um, where's the research that you're talking about? Because that is... That is pretty big claim. No better clock anywhere. But see, this is like this clock stuff. Pay, pay three grand for a stupid clock. Man. Okay. So anyway, um, oh yeah. See here you go. 
you missed out on on antelope. Anyone wants to confess that uh, he was stupid enough to buy their atomic clock for huge bucks after Apogee became a thing in Rosendahl, et cetera, before Apogee became a thing. Let's see, antelope. Um, atomic clock. So let's see, what does this thing cost? Oh, discontinued. Um, let's see if anybody actually sold this thing. Oh, seven thousand dollars. Okay. Um, eel atomic technology. Uh, rubidium core. Well, you know, it's gonna be most accurate. That's great, but what good does that do for you? Um, yeah, I don't see much. Ultimate tool in achieving analog sound. This is analog to digital converter. What What is analog sound? Like, this is such weasel word. Yeah, psychoacoustic clock. How much for that? I got the jitters. Oh, man, that should be a T-shirt. Okay. And I think that was probably it for, for this one. Um, Uh, oh yeah that's the other thing so yeah you've got a seven thousand dollar clock and, and what are you paying on your mics but you know a lot of the guys who buy that will buy the um, forty thousand dollar mic when a four hundred dollar mic will do okay so i just want to go back through the four parameters, right? Um, this is on Ethan Weiner's page, but pretty much you're going to see this the same sort of way pretty much everywhere. So he's saying only four parameters are needed to define everything that affects audio quality. Noise, frequency response, distortion, and time-based errors. So noise is the background hiss you hear when you turn your receiver way up, and you can also hear it during quiet passages when playing open reel or cassette tapes. A close cousin is dynamic range which defines the span expressed in decibels between the background noise and the loudest possible level before the onset of gross distortion. CDs and DVDs have a very large dynamic range, so any noise you hear was either from the original analog tape, was added as a byproduct during production, or present in the room and picked up by the microphones that when the recording was first made. So, you know, with 16-bit with digital... It's not signal to noise, uh, well, digital in, in general. It's not signal to noise, really. It's signal to error ratio. There's a point where quantization will um, will, will cause a, a problem. Uh, you'll still hear the audio through the noise. So let's uh, let's let's see if I can't just pull something up real quick, and we'll put a decimator on here. Um, let me get some MP3s. What do I have? What do I have that I can grab real quick? Um, do I have any mixes that I can grab? I thought I did. Sorry. Just looking for a, um, there we go. I'm just going to grab a, grab a wave file and I'm going to get something pretty squished. Um, okay. So if you're coming on Friday, these guys will be playing out, out front here and, uh, this, uh, this will probably demonetize this video because, well, never mind. I'm not monetized anyway. So I'm going to loop this section here. And hopefully this ain't going to be too loud. Okay, so let's look at the source properties here. This is a 24-bit file, okay? This is mastered around, like, modern levels. Uh, I'm just going to play the source. And let me get the... Uh, 
bit. There's a bit, bit depth, bit depth reduction. Okay. So let's play it at the full 24 bits. Let me, let me get a cool section here. Okay. So start turning it down. So there's 23 bits. Okay, let's go to 22 bits. 20. But I don't want to bore you. Let's go down to 16 bits where the where the CD is. Okay, versus. Nothing. I mean, it's the same thing. Okay. Uh, let's start going down now. Now, 15 bits. This is less than a CD. Same, right? 13 bits. Wait, surely 13 bits can't be enough, right? But let's look at these meters real quick, okay? Take a look at this meter, okay? Either one, the input or the output. I don't think this meter is even dropping below uh, minus six decibels full scale. So let's keep going. Well, hear any difference here? Ten bits, man. Come on. Ten bits. Give me a Nintendo, uh, the original Nintendo territory in a second. Or, uh, 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 sorry. Nine bits. Hear any difference? Eight bits. Now we're in ancient video game territory. Hear any difference? Okay, we're going to keep going. Seven bits. Six bits. Okay, you may, depending on what you're listening on, you might be starting to hear something. Let me go back to seven. Nothing that you'd probably object to. It's, um... Yeah, and seven and, and, and six bits are probably going to feel okay on this. Five bits you might start to hear. Maybe not. Hey, we're at five bits now, and this is still... Come on, let's be honest. This is perfectly acceptable. Okay? Five-bit audio. Five bits. For all this talk, we talk about 64-bit floating point and all this stuff. And there's a reason for that, because there's uh, problems accumulate, but... We're at five bits now, okay? Five bits. Get that? I mean, really get that into your head. That's five bits. Let's go down to four. I think you might be hearing something now. Let me, let me turn this off. Okay, you hear that? Kind of, kind of a hiss in the background, sort of. Let's go to three bits. Turn it on and off. Three bits. Twenty-four bits. You might say that 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 the four bits actually sounds a little bit more aggressive and and maybe has a little bit more high end. But uh, it's probably not what you really want, but it, it could be. Let's go to three bits. Okay, I think you're hearing that. Okay, so let's go to two bits. I mean, you're not going to die in three bits, but you're really nice. 
Now we're really getting into the story, right? But it still sounds like the music. Yeah, let's go down to Hawaii then, okay? Here we go. Now, that's messed up. But if you're hammering the crap out of your mixes, hey, 8 bits is going to be fine. Um, let's go. I'm going to play a quiet section now. Now, let's. Now we're going to see something. Okay, so let's go to the full 24 bits. Okay, now watch what happens as we start going down. We're still going to be okay at 16 bits. CD quality, we're fine. All bits. Oh, you're fine. Okay, I think we're starting to hear something. Maybe. A little bit. So that's eight bits. Kind of subtle, but you can hear it. Oops, sorry. Let me make sure we're, we're still on. I keep turning on and off and forgetting which way I'm in. Okay, 15 bits. noise is a little bit more obvious with the lower level material the one that you usually the the one that they're going to say is is during a fade out right during a um especially a symbol okay let's, let's get let's get up here on the on the symbol of fade out here and if we have to turn up the quiet part a lot you're definitely going to hear it a lot more so i'm going to i'm going to turn this up crank this okay so let's let's just slowly go down here Okay, so you can probably hear that toggling of these bits here at 11 bits. Okay, 10 bits here now. I'm really hearing the noise. Okay, versus 24. So if we go to 8 bits here, it's really obvious, right? It sounds broken. So all that babbling is just to say that, look, um, dynamic range matters. And, and in digital, it's not really signal to noise so much as signal to error. I mean, we're not just hearing noise come up. We're hearing things getting broken there. Um, so let's see. Uh, uh, Subsets of noise are AC, power-related hum and buzz, electronic crackling, vinyl record clicks and pops, between station radio noises, tape modulation noise, crosstalk. A lot of these things are things that people <laughs> uh, don't even know about. They weren't even born into a world where they mattered. But um, uh, windows that rattle and buzz at high volume levels, uh, triboelectric effect, cable effect. Uh, you're unlikely to notice tape modulation noise outside of recording studios because it's specific to analog tape recorders, which are fast becoming obsolete. I wonder what this was written. This is quite a, must have been quite a while ago. Um, and are usually hidden by the music itself. Yep. So masking. You can sometimes hear it if you listen carefully to a recording of a bass solo where each note is accompanied by a sound that disappears in between the notes. The tribal electric effect is also called handling noise because it occurs when poorly made, when handling poorly made cables. I haven't seen a cable with this defect in about 20 years. Um, <laughs> you can find them. 
Uh, so, you know, that's, that's your signal noise ratio. That's one of your four parameters, right? Um, frequency response is how uniformly a device responds over a range of frequencies. Errors are heard as too much or too little bass, mid-range, or treble. For most people, the audible range extends from about 15 hertz at the low end to just shy of 20 kilohertz at the high end. Even though many audiophiles believe it's important for audio equipment to respond to frequencies far beyond 20 kilohertz, in truth, there's no need to reproduce these ultrasonic content because nobody can hear it. Subsets of frequency response are physical microphonics, electronic ringing and oscillation, acoustic ringing. These, are sub these subsets are not necessary for consumers to understand, but they're important to design engineers and acousticians. So a lot of times people get um, don't really get that there's a couple different parts to this. So first of all, there's the frequency response. Like how flat is the signal inside that pass band that you're talking about? And then the other part of it is bandwidth. How wide is that? So, um, you know, maybe you have a low bandwidth uh, device where it really, the frequency response, it, it can only reproduce frequencies between 200 hertz and 2000 hertz let's say um that would be the bandwidth but the, the the frequency response would be how flat is it uh between 200 hertz and two kilohertz so i think first you have to know the bandwidth that you're talking about or or measure the bandwidth and then talk about how flat it is inside there and then there's distortion distortion is the common word for the more technical term non-linearity and it adds new frequency components that were not present in the original source. And this is really why anti-aliasing filters are so crazy important because this is this is what they what they do introduce. Um, when music passes through a device that adds distortion, new frequencies are created that may or may not be pleasing to the ear. Um, you know, for us guitar players, we love creating distortion, right? Uh, the design goal for audio equipment is that all distortion be so low in level that it can't be heard. I'll return later to the notion that distortion can be pleasing. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we, we like to distort guitar amps. There are two basic types of distortion, harmonic and intermodulation, and both types are almost always present together. Harmonic distortion adds new frequencies that are musically related to the source. So, you know, the difference between like a ring modulator and a distortion box. For the most part, the distortion box is going to add harmonics that are that are parts of it or think of like a sine wave versus a violin the violin's got a bunch of these are extra um harmonics they're not necessarily all that non-linear but um to give you an idea uh like a, a violin may sound sound definitely sounds different than a sine wave of the, of the same pitch um in layman's term, harmonic distortion adds a slightly thicker, buzzy quality to music. All musical instruments create tones having harmonics, so a device whose distortion adds a little more adds a little more merely changes the instrument's character by some amount. Electric guitar players use harmonic distortion, often lots of it, to turn a guitar's inherent plink plink sound into a singing tone having great power and sustain. Yes. Okay, then intermodulation distortion requires two or more frequencies to be present, and this is you go do your bluesy band or, or a ghost, uh, what do you call it, unison band, um, a taunting band on a guitar where you're playing two notes and you're bending one of them. Um, intermodulation distortion requires two or more frequencies to be present, and it's far more damaging because it creates new content that is not musically related to the original. Even in relatively small amounts, intermodulation distortion adds a dissonant quality that is unpleasant to hear. Another type of distortion is called aliasing, and it's quite unique to digital recording. Like intermodulation distortion, aliasing creates new frequencies not harmonically related to the original, so it's unpleasant and irritating to hear. Fortunately, in all modern digital gear, aliasing is so low in level that it's inaudible. But remember, processes like you know our guitar amp simulators, compressors, things like that, can add horrific amounts of aliasing problems, and, and it's actually something we fight a lot. Um, so you're seeing uh, Poon is just saying, I'm reminded how often, how I never heard the springs and strings above the nut until they were pointed out. Now all my guitars have foam and tissue shoved in them everywhere. Yep. Even my non Floyd guitars. Um, have I seen the movie, the red violin? Not yet. I might have to go look at it. Um, and then the other ones is, is time-based errors. Um, uh, there are phase issues that you could talk about in in your um 
deciding about the quality and fidelity of a, of a process, but you know, it's not your converters. Um, let's see. Let's see, let's see. You even say anything. Wow. Flutter. Not really talking about face, but anyway, that's the pieces that matter. And the next thing that matters is today times is having, um, guava ribs. So I'm out of here. That's my show for today. And I uh, will, uh, See you guys next week. Uh, Poon Angel, I'll go check out the Red Violin. Let's go see what that's about. All right, see you guys.